G'day friends, welcome to today's YouTube video. Now, I'm going to do a real-time video today. I think I've got about 40 minutes in me before I have to go and do something else. Um, I just wanted to kind of catch up, um, chat a little bit. This is going to be a pretty candid chat, so if this is your first time to the channel, I probably wouldn't recommend watching this video because it's going to get a little heavy. I'll give you a bit of a trigger warning before we start. I'm going to be talking about PTSD. Um, I'm going to be talking about, like, if you've got a trigger um, against, like, uh, natural disasters or car accidents, this is probably not a video that you might want to watch. Um, there's plenty of other videos on the channel, so I would recommend that you go and watch one of those. I'm just going to be drawing. I've kind of got this uh, urge just to draw with a pencil, possibly watercolor over the top of it. Sometimes I like to draw in pencil and watercolor over the top, so like the shadings underneath and uh, and lay it over the top. I've got a very simple, um, just like a watercolor A5 insert here that I work in sometimes, and uh, this is on Amazon. If you want to check anything out that I'm using, mostly everything is categorized in my Amazon storefronts, and uh, there's a link down to that below. So uh, I'll just leave you with that, and I think we'll just get started. I'm gonna let this run real time, um, a little sniffly, a little nasal. <laughs> <laughs> when have I not been lately? Literally, my allergies have been terrible, but I thought I would just uh, check in with you and kind of uh, have a bit of a chat. I know this past week I've been pretty low profile on social media and I put a post on my Instagram to kind of explain where I was going to go. I mean, I wasn't going anywhere. I was at home, but <laughs> uh, the fact that I was, uh, you know, not very accessible this past week, which is, is different. I mean, I feel like sometimes, uh, you know, you don't need to say those things, but at the same time, I'm also a viewer um, of a lot of people. I've, you know, I started this whole mixed media arts and crafts art journaling journey, watching people on YouTube. And I do understand that sometimes uh, you're kind of left with a sense of like, well, what's going on? Is everything really okay? Uh, I wish someone would just explain something to me because, you know, you, you get invested and I really appreciate that you've invested you know, your time and your energy, and for those of you who are customers, your your literal money <laughs> into uh, JLB Creative, and I, I do not feel pressured to give an explanation. I actually more feel encouraged to kind of chat today, tonight rather, um, a bit more openly about what kind of happened last week and, and over this past week. I will just say that I'm okay. Like, I'm, I'm okay now. Um, at the time, I don't even really know where to start this. I'm, I'm, what, should we just get so distracted and talk at the camera for 60 minutes and not even do any drawing? <laughs> I don't even know what I'm going to draw. Something, something's going to happen. Um, if you've been around for a while, you may know this, but I used to be a, a professional dancer. And uh, I say used to be very loosely. I can still dance. I, you know, I can still do it. I'm just not currently employed as a dancer. And, uh, you know, that's its own sore, sore spot. Another uh, sensitive s story for another time, I guess. But if you've been following, um, perhaps you know some of my backstory. When I was a dancer, I used to work on contract uh, overseas. So I'm originally from Australia. Uh, when I was 18, I went and did my first contract over at Tokyo Disneyland. And it was always my dream to end up working for Disney in some capacity. And the fact that I got to do it in Tokyo, which, you know, I, I learned Japanese throughout school. I really, really wanted to go there. It was just, it was the biggest dream come true moment. And so much of that experience was so unbelievable to have at, you know, the ripe old age of 18. Um, and I just loved it. I, I then went to work on uh, cruise ships for Royal Caribbean as a dancer. And then I went back to uh, Tokyo Disney in 2011. And uh, just at the start of my contract there, we had the big earthquake and tsunami. And it kind of, I mean, it's a, it's a natural disaster. I think, you know, even if you weren't traumatized by it, it's, it's still pretty scary. I don't know anyone that was kind of going through those motions and thinking, oh yeah, everything's fine. This is sweet. Wasn't shaking a bit. Um, you know, but we all dealt with that very, very differently. And I had some friends that would, you know, struggle as much as I would. And I had some other friends that didn't seem as bothered by it, but for whatever reason, just, you know, the way I am, the things that I'm scared of, I'm petrified of dying. I, I have too much to live for to die. Um, so I, I think I just kind of took it really hard. And whilst I was there and I was still with so many people that went through it together, there was this camaraderie and this kind of sense of calm between us all, because 
you know, we had experienced it together. We knew what that was like. It was kind of unspoken at times. Uh, if someone was dealing with a bit of that uh, anxiety, a bit of that stress, because, you know, the, the quake was so big that the aftershocks were, you know, some of the biggest quakes people had felt, you know, in general anyway. Um, and obviously all of, the, all of the devastation that happened afterwards was just, was really, really difficult to watch unfold in a place that was just so magical to so many people and, and meant so much to us. Um, you know, we loved the Japanese. We still do. I still do. <laughs> um, such an amazing race. Like, there, is it a race? Um, it, just such a great country to be in, such an amazing culture, and to see such devastation brought about uh, so naturally, so quickly. It was just... For me, it was very traumatizing, and I couldn't shake those feelings of anxiety that I had all the time. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more candid with you. This is something I don't really tell anyone, but I think I'm at the point now, especially knowing how I've been dealing with things and, you know, kind of the, um, the little practice run I had of this past week being thrown back into that space. I think I'm a bit more ready to talk about some of the things that I experienced as a result. I won't go fully into it because there are still some things that are quite personal. Um, but one of the things that happened afterwards is that I always just always felt anxious. I just, I was always petrified that it was going to happen again. One of the things about earthquakes is you can't really predict them and you don't really know how bad they're going to be. They just happen. There's not much of a warning beforehand, if any, and you know, you just kind of ride it out. And a lot of people will say, you know, oh, it was a small one. It was a small one. But you know, in my mind, I also thought the one on that day was going to be a small one. And it's not until it's over. Do you really understand? Uh, whether it was small or not. And some of the things that happen afterwards, um, some of the experiences you have been, that happen post-natural disaster bring about their own kinds of anxieties. You know, the fact that you couldn't get water or the fact that you couldn't get food or, uh, you know, that everything was closed or you couldn't get a flight somewhere and, you know, transport stuff. It's, just, it's so, it's so, like the scope of the problem becomes so much bigger and it affects all these parts of your life that you didn't really, you take for granted that could be really affected. And sometimes it, it you know, I used to tell myself like, well, why complain? Because there's, you know, you still have this, you still have that. There was still so much to be thankful for. And yes, a lot of us were extremely lucky to uh, get out of it the way we did. But just because I was thankful didn't mean that I also couldn't acknowledge that I was scared. And for the longest time, I thought that was true. I, I actually just kind of ignored it and dealt with my anxiety in a way that really wasn't helping. Um, one of the things I used to feel all the time was so, so, so nervous that I felt like I was always going to throw up. And not a lot of people know this. Um, I think even some people that I've worked with in the past might find this a little odd to hear if they ever do come across this video, but I used to carry around a, an air sickness bag or a plastic bag, any kind of bag. For the longest time, it was an air sickness bag uh, that I could in my pocket just in case I threw up. And I carried it for about a year and a half after that earthquake because I was just petrified it was going to happen again. And the anxiety of that just ate away at me all the time. Even if I wasn't speaking about it, even if I was having a good day in the back of my mind, my body was trying to prepare itself for what that would be again and if I could handle it any better the second time or um, you know I, it, it's just it became such a huge problem at the time I kind of just thought well if this is my own personal struggle then I'll just leave it at that you know one day it'll all go away and it didn't it you know no amount of ignoring it was was getting rid of it in fact the anxieties were just kind of piling on top of one another and they started to dictate how I was living which is scary. I mean, I was 20, I was 20 at that point. And to have already started, you know, living my life in that amount of fear was, was just not what I wanted. I had never pictured that for myself. I never, I never even knew that something could rattle me that much. Cause I mean, I'd been through stuff before that, um, no kind of natural disasters on that level or anything, but I've definitely had some life experience that had, you know, shaped me in a way where I thought I was pretty resilient. I was pretty strong. I could handle a lot. Um, but you know, nothing, I don't think we even know half the time as people, what would set us off. And when it does, uh, sometimes there's so much shame attached to it that you just don't fix it. You think, well, this could just be my new normal. Could I just get used to this? And so I did for the longest time. I just accepted that I'll just be that guy that secretly carries around, you know, an air sickness bag in his pocket and no one has to know. And if no one knows, then I'll be fine. But 
keeping myself vulnerable to all of those fears really started to dictate how I would live and it got to the point where I would avoid public transport or I would vo avoid travel in general and you know friends would ask me to go out and I would just think you know what I'm going to be such a hassle trying to keep all of this to myself and be scared the whole time I'm just not going to go out. I became a very non-committal person which really did follow through even up until this point I would can still consider myself non-committal. Um, part of that is because I actually just voice what I do and don't want now. <laughs> <laughs> very candidly. Um, but then another part of that really does still have to do with some of the anxieties that I haven't managed to uh, fix just yet. I've made progress and I think that's why I'm in a better place now and able to start that process of kind of um, sharing in the hopes that, you know, not even in the hopes that it would help anybody really. I mean, does that sound selfish? <laughs> it's not my goal to really help anyone. It's just, um, I hope that a byproduct of just sharing a bit more openly, um, possibly might make someone feel a little less alone in it because I just felt for so long that I wasn't allowed to have that problem or that it was so unrealistic or it was so, um, it was so unfathomable that that would happen again, uh, in the same way that you should just let it go. Um, I, I think it's, you know, I've, I've learned before that there's this exercise where they tell you to, um, you know, picture a, a big pink elephant in a room and then, now you can't picture it. Like, don't think about it at all. Just take it off your mind. And then you, inevitably, you keep thinking about it. Because when you're told not to, it actually comes right to the front. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with our brains. I don't know why we're like that. Humans are just stupid, I guess. But for the longest time, that's what I was telling myself. Just don't think about it. Don't don't mention it to yourself. Avoid it at all costs. But I, it, it started to become a bigger problem. I wouldn't travel, I wouldn't go places, I became a little more antisocial. Even when I was by myself, it's not like I was feeling better, I was just feeling like I had a little bit of control over something, and it just got so out of hand. Like, there were points when I, I couldn't even be on a bus for like 10 minutes before I started panicking, because I didn't want to be in an enclosed space, I didn't want to be um, around a lot of people if I felt like I was going to throw up, I didn't want people to see that, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to be around them. Um, I worked on cruise ships, so it was terrible, but the first time I got on a cruise ship after that, I panicked when I heard the engines start. Now, I'd worked on them before, I knew the engines were going to start, but even the rumbling of that, um, the engine, one day I was sitting at home and, uh, and on my bed, and my sister came and jumped on my bed, and, uh, like, I burst into tears because it just, it felt like everything started shaking again, I just wasn't ready for it. And I thought, this is, this is getting a little out of hand now, like, I can't... I can't keep living like this because it's going to stop me from doing anything. Like, I won't be able to function. It's not like I was, you know, ever going to forget what had happened, but there had to be a better way for me to deal with it. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out what that way was. But I started to realize over time that ignoring it just wasn't helping. So I've tried a bunch of different therapies and... Um, Oh, did I say this? Thank you. <laughs> thank you as well to, um, before we start anything, I guess I should just say thank you to everyone that did reach out and offered advice and even just support and understanding with your messages. It was very, very kind of you. Um, you know, it, it, it's just so bizarre to me that there would be anyone out there, uh, that not only just watches videos and has a good time journaling, but w would actually care enough about me to reach out in that way. I, I really, really, truly appreciate it. Um, and some of your suggestions I have actually tried before. I've tried different types of therapy and, um, you know, there are a bunch that, that really didn't do a lot for me. There were a bunch that it did do a lot for me. Ultimately what happened was I actually had to face a lot of those fears head on, but I couldn't just recreate an earthquake. Do you know what I mean? Like I couldn't just throw myself back into it all. So it had to be in a way where I wasn't so much tackling the fear of it happening again. I was tackling all of the anxiety, uh, and all of the um, kind of PTSDs that were a result of that anxiety. So the idea of going out with a, you know, a sick bag in my pocket, I had to get rid of that. I had to learn how to be okay without that and how to accept that, you know what, if I did need to throw up, there was a place over there, there was a place over there, I could go to a trash can or it could just happen where it happened. And if it did, you know, you've, you've got a reason, it's okay. Um, you know, hopefully people will be understanding, but to tell myself that at 20 and 21 just seemed crazy. And I didn't know of anyone else that was going through it because I, I certainly think that it's hard enough to talk about as a grown adult, but as a young adult, 
I didn't, I don't think people are so willing to share that part of themselves. Um, this is super vulnerable and I certainly wasn't. So it's no one's fault. Like no one should have come and saved me from myself, but yeah, it was, it was a super interesting time. I'm not going to lie. I didn't like it. I loved the life that I was living. I had so many great moments and so much um, that happened that I'm so grateful for, but I'd be lying to say that I was just breezing through it all. A lot of the time it was a daily struggle um, just to not freak out and, and panic. And that happened for a few years. And it, it, it literally got to the point, like I said, where I couldn't go on public transport. I couldn't be outside for too long or didn't want to be up in tall buildings. I still have a big fear of being up too high in a building um, because the shaking is a lot more aggressive the higher you get up off the ground. So all of that to say that 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 compounded itself into a massive problem for me. Now, when I was uh, dancing on uh, Disney Cruise Line in 2015, I went out on a just kind of like a beach day and we were riding um, ATVs, like the four wheelers. This is a separate story, but it, it kind of goes with everything that I, I feel. Um, we were riding and, and coming back from the beach, uh, my friend and I, and got hit by a taxi van as we were pulling out. Now, I had a helmet on, but I wasn't wearing any, like, I mean, it was just, we were, it was a day at the beach. I was wearing shorts and a, um, and just a pair of flip flops. And I took the brunt of that um, that crash on the left-hand side of my body. And because I saw the van coming quickly, I tried to pull my leg off the ATV to jump off it. Cause I just, it was inevitable that we were going to hit. And, you know, I, I don't want to go too much into that, the specifics of everything. Ultimately, if I had to, you know, cut a long story short, um, it was the, the van that was in the wrong and speeding around a corner with a really bad, um, it was a really bad corner to see beyond that. Uh, we were pulling out slowly, like the, the traffic was clear. Thank goodness my friend was okay because she was a lot smaller than I am. I am. And um, as it were, my foot was just kind of destroyed at that point. And I had three surgeries. I thought, you know, I, I don't want to go into too much of it because the story itself is quite triggering for me. <laughs> but all of that to say, I developed after that a, a huge fear of being in cars, being on the road. Um, you know, any kind of foot, like if I, if I just twisted my ankle kind of wrong, I, I thought it, like I was going to lose my foot. I had a lot of surgeries and a lot of visits to the physiotherapist for about 16 months was like the full back to dancing. And, and I was so, so lucky to have also like been able to go home and, and had my family around me for that, that time. Um, but also to have like a full healing, my foot will never really be the same. Uh, you know, possibly some early onset arthritis, <laughs> but I was a dancer with terrible technique. So that was bound to happen anyway. But, um, yeah, beyond that, I did make a full recovery from that. It just didn't matter to the part of my brain that became really scared of that. And I was already, you know, really working hard to get over some of the anxieties I had about, um, you know, feeling unsafe, due to natural disasters. And then suddenly I started feeling unsafe in something that was a little bit more common, like a car accident. And I just felt, uh, you know, at times I felt like this is super unfair. Like, why is this happening? Why, why do I have to be the one to keep going through this? I enjoy my life. I want to enjoy my life to the fullest. Um, you know, I, I felt really sorry for myself a lot of the time and I, that wasn't even helping. Like I could feel as sorry for myself as I wanted to, but it wasn't going to fix anything. The only thing that really fixed, you know, a lot of those anxieties were facing them. And it meant that I had to get back out on the road. I had to drive again. I had to be vulnerable and be the passenger in this because I, I, I felt like if I was at least the driver, then I could, I could control it. I could get out of the way if I needed to, um, which was stupid. I mean, there was no avoiding what had happened, um, on either of our parts, like even as the driver, I couldn't have avoided what had happened because I would have done exactly the same thing. I would have pulled out exactly the same time that she pulled out. I would have driven the same way. I would have gone at the same speed. I mean, she's super safe driver. We'd, we'd done that um, whole experience before um, riding around ATVs on the island. Um, so there were just a lot of irrational fears that, you know, what I used to consider very irrational fears, but were very, very real to me. 
and the anxiety that they induced was just kind of crippling at times and I hated it. Like I just hated it because I thought this is not what I want. This is not what I want for me. I, I've, I have too much to appreciate and to live for and to experience to just sit in this room and feel scared about everything. But it, it was so much hard work to kind of push myself beyond that anxiety. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to reveal the rest of the parts of the story because they're honestly, some of them are still in process and some it is still a daily battle for me to get through. But at the same time, I made such great progress. I mean, I felt some earthquakes here before. They were very, very little. Um, I freak out a little bit, but I'm generally okay to bring myself back to reality. And once that happens, I... Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of smooth sailings. It, it doesn't stick around. It doesn't linger like it used to. But the one that we had last week, uh, it was a little too big for what I think I was ready for. Um, it was a little too, too real. And it sent me right back to being 20 years old, feeling all of that for the first time. Uh, I live in an apartment, you know, four stories off the ground. So I, I felt all of a sudden, like, I couldn't live in this apartment anymore. And I'm telling Steve, like, I think we have to move. I don't think I can stay here. It's too high off the ground. What if I need to run away? Like, what, what are we going to do? Um, after it happened, I kind of sat out in a car park for a while and just tried to calm myself down. It just, it was, it was a little too much. And, you know, the, the logical side of me was like, you can't let this affect you because you have a lot of work to do. And, that wasn't helping. <laughs> I was making myself more upset by uh, by not giving myself any grace. And then after that, I just kind of thought, well, and we had one on July 4th as well. Like that we had a one that I definitely felt and was very shaken up the day before. So for this to happen the day after, I was like, oh, we're building to like something massive here. And that's why I think it really took me off guard because I thought, well, I dealt really well with the one on the 4th, but the second one on the 5th, like that was just not that was too much. I, I had reached the limit of what I thought I could actually handle. So I kind of shut down a little bit and I didn't know what to do. And honestly, I put that Instagram post up very upset because I just needed to let people know that I wasn't accessible right now. Like I'm kind of closed for business. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't, you weren't really going to get anything good out of me except just a bit of a mess. Um, I needed time to you know, check back in with all of that work that I had done over these years, because I, I just thought like, oh no, it, I'm going to have to start again. All of these anxieties are going to come back and I'm not going to know what to do. Like it's, I, I'm going to have to start again. This is insane. I don't want to. And I just, I just needed to take a step back, plain and simple. I can't make it more difficult than that. Really. I just needed a break. Um, not from work, I did work actually work is a nice distraction for me, but I think I needed a break from being accessible to people because, you know, I generally like to fend for myself and think that I do a pretty good job of, of taking care of myself for the most part, <laughs> obviously not with everything. I'm literally on a diet right now from being so overweight, but I kind of just needed to be taken care of last week. And I brought that into this week and I'm not upset about it. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I actually think it was the right thing for me to do. And even though I still feel really vulnerable talking about it, I don't think ignoring it and pretending like it didn't happen is helping either. So I just wanted to give you a bit of that backstory as to, you know, what some of that is. I really don't want you to feel like you have to weigh in or, you know, even address anything I've said in this video. Um, you know, I don't need anyone to like really go out of their way to try and recommend certain types of therapy or, um, you know, to really check in with my space every two minutes. Like I, I am doing so much better. I just really took advantage of that time to sit with myself, kind of check back in with my family, ask everyone if I, if I really, did handle it better because I had horse blinders and I was so blind to all of the good things that I, I was doing to handle it. 
all I saw was the problems with myself and how I was handling it and how I could have done better and how embarrassing it was that I wasn't doing better. And of all people, like I should have been the most ready for that kind of an earthquake. So why, why is no one else upset? Like, why am I the most upset? It, it, I was really starting to beat myself up about it and it just got so overwhelming um, until I could take those horse blinders off and realize, you know, I was actually very practical. I grabbed water. I grabbed the cats. I put them in their thing. I went and stayed outside and went to a, uh, like once the shaking had stopped, I went to a, an open field. I kind of stayed outside and calmed myself down. Like I did a lot of practical things that, that I should have been so proud of. Cause the last time I just stood there and froze and then was in denial and it wasn't helping anything. <laughs> you know, I was praying. I was making sure that, uh, I was holding strong on, on the truths that I know and, you know, seeking counsel, letting myself being taken care of. I think I was just overall so much healthier about it this time than I ever have been before. And that in itself is something that I should have, uh, you know, been a little quicker to notice rather than all of the fear and anxiety I noticed so quickly. But um, the enemy will do that to you. I, f I really believe that. Get in there the easiest way he knows how. And I just kind of you know, I, I, like I said, years ago, I got sick of being a victim to all of that fear. And I knew I wasn't going back there. I was just scared I was going to get dragged back there. And I, I needed to know how to fight that properly. And so here I am <laughs> a week later, still obviously a little, um, you know, meditative on the whole thing. I'm not going to say like, it doesn't cross my mind. I still have, I still kind of get a little upset going in the elevator. Um, I still like to be outside a lot, like I kind of lived outside this past week. Uh, at night I have been sleeping with the light on sometimes just because I, I don't want to feel like I'm going through all of that in the dark. Um, but that's fine. I, I, it's, it shouldn't be something that makes me less of a person, you know? I, I think I'm allowed to have things that I'm scared of. I'm oddly enough not scared of other things <laughs> that I feel like a lot of people might be scared of. Um, you know, Australia's got like, what, 50 of the deadliest animals in the world, and I don't really bat an eyelash if I see one, but, um, this is just one of those things for me, and I think my personal experience led me down that garden path, and I did deal with this a lot better, I just kind of needed a, a moment to make sure that that was true, um, because it was so easy to lie to myself and be like, you did worse, you were worse than before, you should be even more panicked now, like, what did you, why, why couldn't you figure it out this time? But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you with that. I'll kind of put a cap on that story. Uh, perhaps I'll revisit the whole thing another time. Who knows? <laughs> I'd like to think that I won't have to, but you know, it's still in process. A lot of those anxieties at one point in my life were very debilitating and, you know, they, they stopped me from doing so much. They weren't very easy to get rid of. And some of them, you know, hang around longer than others. And a lot of those issues that surround that, you know, haven't been fully resolved. You know, I only like to bring you things that are resolved too. So I'm just going to check that it's still filming. Could you imagine the whole time? I like to bring you things that have a bit of resolution because I think the worst thing I could do is kind of, you know, sit everyone down for a bit of a video and then bring you all into my problems that would trigger your own issues and then not leave you with anything positive. <laughs> I feel like it's like, it's not a very good uh, duty of care for me just to involve you all in all of that and then leave you high and dry. So I think, um, you know, the positive that I do want to leave you with is even though that some of that is still in process, I, I am so proud of my healing that I've done. I'm so proud of the, uh, effort that it took to get to a place where I could be honest with myself about what I was struggling with and that I could rip that bandaid off that, you know, that self pity, that sympathy soiree I had held for myself for so long. Um, the excuses eventually stopped. I stopped letting myself get away with being that upset about everything and just, you know, faced the fear that it's not going to get better until I, until I do something scary, like walk out of the house without a sick bag. It may seem so dumb. It may seem so trivial to so many people, but you have no idea how much comfort I had placed in that object, how much it calmed me down. Even then it didn't work. You know what I mean? Like it still reminded me that I should be feeling sick or that I could be feeling sick. And, you know, it, it seemed like it, it's like, it's a bad thing to do because you place all of that importance on it and it keeps you in that cycle like that. I don't know if anyone else has been like that and kind of found an, 
an object. I, I can't stand looking at sick bags now, I tell you what. <laughs> On the plane, I look at them and I just, it makes me anxious now to look at a sick bag knowing just how, just how I had let that become such a, um, a comfort to my anxiety when I shouldn't have been trying to comfort my anxiety. I should have been trying to make it so uncomfortable that it wanted to leave. I, don't, I shouldn't have pandered to it. And I'm not going to feel sorry about that or, or hate myself for it. It's a genuine mistake that I feel like I made in life. And I knew that I didn't want that. So I decided to work against it. That doesn't mean it's easy either. I don't want people to think that I'm sitting here saying like, oh, you have anxiety, you should work against it. Um, everyone is in their own timing. Everyone is in their own on their own journey. Um, I don't know what it takes for some people to snap and say like, I can't do this anymore. I have to change something. Uh, for me, it took quite a long time considering um, considering how bad it got for, for my own life and what I wanted to live. But, you know, the process to healing some of those things isn't the same for everybody anyway. So I don't, I, this is really all about personal experience. And if I have kind of set something off in you, I'm, I'm incredibly sorry. I really am trying to be as sensitive about this as I can. But this is, um, this is all just based off my own experience. I'm actually just sitting here kind of shocked that I managed to create a page of sketches because <laughs> I just haven't been paying attention to the drawing. I think I've been going with something that I've been doing a lot lately, just very simple shapes. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope some of that is illuminating for you. If you have been wondering, I don't want to leave you with this sense of, uh, you know, like you've been baited to know something that you feel like you, you should be knowing. It really isn't, it really doesn't have anything to do with anyone. It doesn't even have anything to do with this channel, my business, my art. A lot of the time I don't channel any of that into art. I actually do a lot of happy stuff with art because it is an outlet for some of that stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't want to, uh, typically I don't want to sit down and bring a lot of that pain into it. I want to use it to heal some of that stuff. Um, uh, funnily enough, going through my uh, Japan journal right now, I have it here. I won't flip it because it's I'm keeping it nice and safe for the course. Um, but going through that and that experience that I had with Stella was was super interesting because it was very different to the experience that Steve and I know. I actually met Steve my first contract out there, like when I was 18. <laughs> That's when we first met. He was working out there as a singer, um, and Steve actually came to do relief work after that earthquake and the tsunami, like he got a first-hand look at, you know, the 7-Eleven was sunk into the ground, the buildings were out of the ground, the roads were cracked, all the um, liquefaction, like all the roads covered in mud and water. Like it was just, it was a lot to look at and to take in. And so I think he has a really good understanding of why it, it is a little traumatic for me. Um, but it was just, it was all the other things too, like not being able to like use water whenever I needed water or the rolling blackouts that we had, or, you know, the fact that the power plant had destabilized and we thought we weren't allowed to eat anything that was canned, but also there wasn't a lot of food around because it was all kind of gone from the shelves once we got there. And, you know, it just, I mean, Disneyland shut down for like a month, a month and a half. And that's crazy to me. I mean, I, I literally lived down the road from this Disneyland. I couldn't even imagine it shut. Like, and then Tokyo Disney is, is humongous. Like those two parks and the amount of people that go there all the time, just to see it shut down, it, it kind of put into perspective, like what natural disasters can do and how they don't discriminate. They kind of just show up wherever, whenever, and all you can kind of do is hold tight to your truths. I really do believe that, um, you know, I will be here to do what I'm here to do. And when it's my time to go home, it's my time to go home. And I, I try to hold on to that as much as I humanly can. I really do struggle with that, truly. <laughs> um, but I don't want to, I just don't want to live a life of fear because it, it it's not what I'm, I, I actually think that renders me incapable. If I'm not, if I, if I feel like I can't actually meet anybody or engage with anybody or go anywhere or be anywhere, then how effective am I really being here on this planet? I know social media has actually uh, opened my eyes to some of that because it, it really does give people a chance that are suffering through some of that stuff to still be social. And I think that's such a great thing as well. But on the flip side, some people could also use that as an excuse to stay in it. And I sometimes feel like 
I can give myself a free pass and say like, oh, I've been social this week. Like I've been on Instagram. I've been chatting to people on YouTube. Um, when in reality, I do need to go and see, you know, real people and have those real interactions as well, like face to face. Um, and it's not to discredit anything that happens on YouTube, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it became a bit of a job for me and a bit of a weird hobby to spot the ways that I would excuse myself from those anxieties or the justifications I would find because they're there. They're easy to find. Um, I actually made it the excuse for why I eat a lot. <laughs> I, I really like to eat a lot. I'm, I, I'm a yo-yo dieter. I've been on a diet since I was two years old. I, um, I eat a lot of my emotions and even that it creeps into that. And I'm like, Oh, you know, there comes a point where you just look at yourself and you say, you know what? I am sick to death of you doing that. Like we're going to tackle this. It may not work the first 20 times we do it, but one day it'll work and you'll thank me. So I just kind of, I'm a little more strict with myself. I don't allow myself those excuses that I used to in the past because they were only working against me. They weren't helping anybody and they certainly weren't helping me. Um, I actually hated it. So I'm going to give these different mouths. They're going to be like weird puppet mouths now. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I, I would say that that's where I think the story is going to end. Who knows where this, the rest of this story will go. But for now, I just wanted to say thank you because I, I did take that time. I'm feeling so much better about uh, how I handled everything. I'm feeling a much more ready to move forward with the healing that I've already been working on. Uh, there are still a few other things that I would like to get a better handle on before I kind of ever speak publicly about them. You know, some things like I wouldn't even tell Steve, some things Steve didn't know until, you know, a month after we got married that I was struggling with because I just didn't feel safe. And I'm pretty open to a degree. Um, you know, if I'm, if I feel comfortable with someone, I will pretty much say what I feel and, you know, say what I mean, mean what I say. It, there's not much to divulge there. Uh, I don't beat around the bush, but for some of it, just the shame, just the shame of feeling that, feeling like it was just the wrong thing for someone my age to be feeling. Or, you know, one of the worst things that happened, um, like one of the worst things I thought to myself at one point, I think this was kind of the turning point, was I thought, oh, I can't wait until I'm like 60 and then I won't need an excuse for why I feel like this. Do you know what I mean? Like people will just put it down to, um, you know, aging that, you know, I, I feel these types of ways or I can't be on public transport or, you know, I, I need to be at a specific exit seat just in case I need to go uh, like out of the building, like run out of the building and just stuff like that. And I thought, and this was, this was years ago. I was like, you're 24, like 23, 24. I don't know. It was around that time. I was like, you cannot, you cannot wait and be excited until you're aged to a point where you won't be doing any of this stuff so that you have a perfectly valid reason to be this worried and be this anxious. And it's not like I knew how to fix it straight away. Like I didn't think, oh, now I can start the journey. I had no idea where to start. I just kind of tried to tackle whatever was pressing. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a battle with some of the stuff. Some of the stuff is a daily, a daily battle, but I don't like to bring that to you because you know, as much as I think about it and some of the anxieties pop up, I do actually have lots of parts of my day that I really enjoy. You know, I think that was also a blessing. I started to look for the silver lining and everything because I, I needed something to take the edge off. And so I tend to find a lot of the silver linings pretty quickly um, so that I can hold on to those whenever I'm starting to feel, you know, really, really overwhelmed by where I feel like uh, anxiety is kind of leading me. And I've never been clinically diagnosed or anything. Like I'm not trying to uh, jump in on any of that. I know there are people with, uh, you know, prescriptions or like to medicines and stuff for anxiety. And I can't pretend to know if that's the same as having a PT like PTSD. Um, and then there's also, you know, PTSD is such an umbrella for so many different things. Uh, like lots of people that are serving the military have PTSD. And obviously we wouldn't be relating to the same types of fears and, and traumas. So it is, I think because it's such a broad scope of an issue, um, it does become hard to understand. And whenever we don't understand something that seems kind of, uh, you know, heavy or, or dramatic or all encompassing, I think there's a tendency to run away from that a little bit 
for myself anyway, that's what I know about me. Um, if I don't understand it, I tend to hate it and deny it. Like, just refuse to accept that it's real. Uh, that's why I hate space, <laughs> funnily enough. I just don't understand it. I don't understand how anyone understands it. It seems so far away and, like, it's... You, like, you can't calculate that stuff. People are just making this up. That's what it seems like in my head. I have this fear of it because I, I can't understand it. You know, I don't know if I'm... I'm not actively working on liking space, so I don't know if that'll ever change. I've got a lot to work on that's uh, not space-related. <laughs> but, you know, if I really wanted to, I'm assuming the first place I would start is maybe watching the movie Gravity. I think that'd be a great way just to throw myself in. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I'm working on it. I think as much as I was scared last week, this was also a super validating experience to have felt that earthquake and felt one that actually did rattle me up a little bit. Um, I didn't like it. I hated it. But it gave me a chance to really test what I had put into place years ago. And I think it really was a good solid foundation. So I'm, I'm really, really happy for that. And I'm very, very thankful that you all allowed me the space to do that uh, just by myself, kind of off social media. And yeah, I know there are going to be some people that don't understand why I keep uh, saying it like that. I think I'm going to switch topics here and go to um, candor of a different nature. <laughs> I, um, I approach making YouTube videos and, uh, and kind of the content creation side from the perspective of, uh, when I was actually going through the recovery for my traffic accident, uh, my car accident, because I was in a YouTube vortex, like a hundred percent of the time I had nothing but free time. So what was I going to do with all that free time? And I had accidentally stumbled across, uh, some videos of people at CHA and I started to find out more about mixed media and, uh, you know, art journaling and what people thought about that and why they did it. And it seemed trendy at the time. And, you know, me and my FOMO kind of kicked in. So I decided I wanted to try it. I thought it was just sketchbooks at first. I was like, oh, people are just calling sketchbooks art journals. But then I realized it was, it could be whatever you wanted. It could be a whole lot more. It could be a whole lot more personal. It could be like a diary in a sketchbook or a scrapbook in a sketchbook or a scratchbook and a scratch pad and a a memo, like a planner, or a, uh, it could be everything you wanted it to be. And so that really caught my attention. And, uh, and it was through all of that that I became heavily invested in all of it and started to learn as much as I could. Now, I had so much downtime uh, throughout that healing process that I watched a ton and I got super addicted to a lot of different people's content. And the thing that... Uh, I loved was when people were so willing to share and I really gravitated towards people that were willing to share. So I knew that, well, I didn't even think that I would ever do it to be honest, but when I did start doing it, I was like, well, I've got to look at back at what I thought made everyone so successful in my eyes. And that was, they were so willing to share. And also that they were really committed to doing it because they were really passionate about it. Like they really loved it. They really, they couldn't help but share it because they were just so excited. They wanted to, they wanted to bring everyone in on that. I loved that as well because I was sat there looking for something to excite me. I was so bored a lot of the time or I was just, you know, asleep and then awake and then asleep and then awake. And I just, I needed some stimulation and it was never their job. They just accidentally did it. So good for them. Um, and I would watch them and I thought, you know, this is just, this is the bee's knees. I love this. I need this. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to get better at this. I'm going to share this. That's when I started sharing. I joined so many Facebook groups. If any of you are from those OG Facebook group days in, um, I think I joined the Dilutions uh, Facebook group. <laughs> I joined uh, the Little Inkers, which I think was Courtney's Facebook group, the Little Raven Ink. Um, I'm not sure if that one's still around. I think I joined another one about Digi Stamps. That was when I was trying to make some side cash doing Etsy. <laughs> My early Etsy days were truly shocking, but um, I really, I truly really tried to make a good go of it. I was like, I'm going to get involved in this. People have really encouraged me, and I'm, I'm feeling very good about it. So there was, there was all of that that I felt so good about. But on the flip side, there were things that would like irritate me, and I'm, I'm easy to irritate, honestly. Like I'm not going to lie. Um, but the one thing that would irritate me more than anything was when. I got so invested and then suddenly like the content ran out and it was so stupid because I was like, they don't owe me any content. And I never like, I didn't want to feel entitled to it, but at the same time I was so invested and, and suddenly people would disappear or suddenly 
you know, or I was told like, oh, you know, grab your stuff. We're going to do this next week. And it never came. And I'd be there ready to do all this stuff, waiting for the videos. And I was like, why did you tell me to do it? Like, if we're not going to do it, we don't have to do it. But you got me all excited for no reason. <laughs> I felt very baited. And then I wondered like, oh, are people just doing this so that like, I'll buy something? Like, is this a marketing tactic? Like, why, you know, what was this now feels like this? And sending me into that kind of a place when I was already feeling so, um, so heavily invested and like, I really needed that kind of an outlet made me feel worse. And so I, I knew when I started my channel, which I didn't even really start to make anything, honestly, it was just for an unboxing video. Um, but I thought if I was really going to commit to this channel, I had to approach it like I was the viewer. And since I didn't like being baited, uh, for things to come that would never come, I decided to always give myself get out of jail free cards. I would always say, you know what, this will come maybe, or this will be maybe. And if something changed, I'd be very transparent about it. If I was struggling to put something up on time, I would say why it wasn't just so people knew. And I think even now why I feel like sharing a bit of it is because I pictured being on the other side. If I just suddenly saw, oh, someone's disappearing because they're having, you know, PTSD, it's like, no, it's not my place to know what their PTSD is, but let's be real. I've invested a lot of time and energy and possibly money into this person. And I feel like I know them or I have met them in person before. I wish, I wish I could just know a little bit more if they were willing to share. And, uh, and I was willing to share. So I hope that if that was any of you, if you could relate and you're the same type of viewer that I am, <laughs> I hope that really did help just a little bit to ease your mind and, uh, and know that it wasn't all it wasn't all terrible. But yeah, that's that's kind of, those are my thoughts on YouTube, to be honest. Candid thoughts, just checking if it's still recording. Oh wow, almost an hour. I should try and wrap this up. I don't know if I'll finish. Maybe I'll watercolor her, because I, I do want to at least watercolor something. I've got my little, my little palette here. Um, but yeah, that's, was there a point to that? I feel like I missed a point. I feel like I went on a tangent. Now I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Either way, I am very happy to be uh, recording this video and putting this up for you uh, if, if you're someone that was curious. And um, who knows, maybe I'll, maybe I'll regret it afterwards and I'll delete it. So save it to your computer if you can. <laughs> no, I won't. Oh, this is quite opaque. Maybe I should have used one that was a little more transparent. Oh, well. Too late, you win some, you lose some. I can always go back over it with graphite, I guess. Sometimes the graphite will move underneath the, um, like underneath the watercolor. So I try not to scrub it too much. If I use, like this one's not that bad. I just used a Ticonderoga, but if I used a um, mechanical pencil, I feel like it'd be a lot more solid because it, it really gets into the substrate. It really sinks into the paper. This, if there's any kind of loose lead on top, like loose graphite, that's what kind of smudges around. It makes it a little muddy. But she's looking like a weird Tim Burton character anyway, so... She can be a little muddy. <laughs> she's a little rough around the edges. Put some little cheeks on her. Wow, that was a lot more red than I thought. Anyway, um, things that are coming and that I'm excited about... Playtest Patreon is coming back. It's called Playtest 2 this year with a 2 instead of the T. I know my mom is very confused. <laughs> um, it's coming back and I'm really, really excited for that. I have a lot of the products. In fact, all of the products are currently being manufactured as we speak. I got a much better head start on that this year than I did last year. Last year, I thought all my lead times were good, um, but we had those unforeseen problems with machines breaking and, um, you know, just shipping problems. My goodness, do you remember that? The FedEx drama. I was on FedEx like every day trying to track down those packages lost in the middle of the country. Um, so I got a, a much better head start on that, which makes me feel a lot better. Um, the content I'm excited for. Again, it's going to be very much like it was last year in the sense that it's just extra. So I just want to reassure people that if you're not going to be joining, there will still be YouTube content up. You know, like there's really no excuse. If I could get through the earthquake and put it up, I'm pretty sure I'll get through Playtest Patreon and put it up. Um, the idea behind Patreon is just, it's a, it's a different experience. It's a different offering. You know, you get your collage sheets, you get your blog posts, you get your um, podcasts, you get your extra videos every week. If you're someone that just really enjoys content, I know I certainly do. Um, 
it's it's just something extra for you to enjoy but it's definitely not something that you need to join i uh, i think a lot of people do join just for fear of missing out which i mean you're really speaking my language there <laughs> i have such bad fomo i completely understand um but i don't want you to think that the only way you're going to be able to see anything or experience anything is if you pay um it's always my mission to keep something accessible um and enjoyable for everybody you know i don't think you should have to miss out just because you might not be able to afford it i personally um didn't pledge to anyone on patreon for a long long time um and then even when i did it was just more part of the me being on their experience because you know financially myself i wasn't really in a place where i could just be um you know donating money every month and you know even when it was my business like it just to me it, you place the value where you see it and some people will really want it and will have you know the twenty dollars set aside or the forty dollars if you want the happy mellow tier or uh, whatever the prices are this year i love that i don't even know my own prices <laughs> i think that's what they were last year i'm not sure if i've changed them or not yet i have to go back and look at my notes um but if you uh you know some people will have that to put aside and they'll be you know really excited and ready to go for it other people might have to save or and might jump in on the last month or maybe purchase the whole thing bundled after the fact um but i don't want to leave you high and dry with nothing while everything else is going on because i also understand fomo and um you know like i said i try to approach putting everything out there as if i were the viewer and since i would hate that i'm not going to subject you to that <laughs> But I'll just ease your mind, because I know last year we did have a bit of a rocky start with, um, you know, unpopular public opinions about uh, Patreon, which I totally understood. And look, I, I've said this before, but there are worse problems than people wanting to see your content. Do you know what I mean? If, if the biggest problem I was having that was people wanted to see more and they were upset that they couldn't, that's a good problem to have. Um, I just have to deal with those issues appropriately. And to me, that just looks like reassuring everyone that there'll still be content going up. And, you know, this video has been quite a long one. I know some people enjoy that. The last one was a long one and tutorial based, uh, the one before last week. Um, last week was, you know, a fun little project that I did. It took a long time to do, but I think I made the video a little shorter. <laughs> um, it, it'll still be quite varied, just like it is in Patreon. If you were in Playtest Patreon, I think... Um, you know, you could never really guess what was coming up next. It was quite, <laughs> it was quite varied. And, uh, and I was just testing the waters this year. I honestly, I keep thinking to myself, oh, I'm just testing the waters again. It's like the same as last year, even though I know how it's going to go. Um, but I, I just want everyone in there to kind of feel like it, it evolves along with the experience. I definitely didn't want to film everything before I got in there and just put it up and let you guys go for it. Like it was a, you know, self-study course. I want to be in there. I want to, you know, create the content that I feel like, you know, would really serve that experience. And so I'm kind of just taking it as it comes this year. It could be a terrible thing. Maybe I haven't planned properly, <laughs> uh, but I think, I think it'd be good. I'm excited to do it nonetheless. And that's all that matters. Last year was so scary. I honestly didn't know if it was going to work out. And I've since seen a lot of new people joining Patreon, like a lot of new people, um, not new to me, like I've been following them, but a lot of other people have started moving over to Patreon, which is nice. Um, it is a good platform for creators that are looking for more of a, a stable uh, kind of like pseudo salary. I've done a whole Patreon recap video before. Why do I feel like I'm just repeating myself? I think just because a long time I really bashed it. <laughs> and I was speaking from that viewer experience where like a lot of what I saw was that people that I was really enjoying following just kind of disappeared. And, uh, and that is why I, I really try to make it my goal to not disappear on anyone. Even when I go on holidays, like when I went on holiday to Japan, there were still videos going up. When I went on a holiday to Australia last year, there were still videos going up throughout Christmas. Like I don't try to, even if I take time off, I don't try to let the content take time off because, you know, it doesn't take a lot to film an extra video here and there. Sometimes it can seem like that. But the reality is this video has been going, what, for like an hour now? Since I'm not going to edit it. It's literally all going up with some nice background music. I'm, uh, you know, it'll just take a little bit to put it on YouTube. And, you know, two and a half hours later, it'll be done. Which, in the grand scheme of things, if I was working a nine to five job, 
you know, how many hours is that? Is it an eight hour day, nine to five? I feel like it's an eight hour day or a nine hour day. I don't know how long your lunches are. Uh, but if I had to do that in an eight hour day and it took two and a half hours, then you could do three YouTube videos in a day if you had an eight hour work day. So it is really all about scheduling. I know sometimes people don't like to push through, like, um, like if you're really struggling to get your art to look like how you want it to look. I know it can be quite difficult to push through that. And I think I've, I'm kind of lucky in that I set myself up with things that I know I'll enjoy. And I have been really good about even putting things up that I don't necessarily think are the best, you know, representation of my skill, uh, but are still useful. Like there's still good videos that people can get something out of. That's really allowed me to maximize my workflow as well. Because I used to think I could only put up things that were really good. And even then it had me questioning like, well, I put that up. It wasn't really that good. <laughs> and then other things I put up that are literally just so random. I, I wanted to say this because I don't know if anyone knows this, but one of my most video, my most viewed videos on YouTube is the review I did of Miniso. You know, the like the cheap Asian store down the road at the, at the mall? The like knockoff Muji. It's literally like my most viewed video. And that is painful um, for me to know. <laughs> because that video was like, there's no throwaway videos on my channel, but let's just call it that because if there was a video that really didn't need to be there, it's probably the mini so review. Even the render no show through sketchbook, like that Copic sketchbook, the first impressions I did of that, that's a super like highly watched video on my channel. I, I tell you what, I look at the analytics because I feel like there's some, um, there's some business sense to look at them, but they really don't make you feel good, do they? Even if your videos are, like, a lot of people are watching them, it's, then you'll just start feeling bad that they're watching the wrong ones you didn't want them to watch. <laughs> it's just, it's a mess. You could never really try and figure out YouTube, so I don't try. Now I've, uh, I've just decided that I'm here to do whatever I like to do. Someone will watch it, someone will enjoy it. And if they don't, I did. That works for me. Does that work for you? <laughs> oh, I'm glad I cheered up towards the end of the video. No, I was I was not upset, but I tell you what, sometimes it's hard to listen to myself talk so seriously because I'm never that serious. And I don't even avoid it. I just, I choose not to speak about a lot of it. Or maybe that is avoiding it. Who knows? Let's not go there. Let's not diagnose that issue. But I usually try to keep everything really light because I like watching that too. I don't like the excessive cutesy like stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, it's not like I hate it, but I do have to take it in very small doses. I can't stand um, watching people that are like very over the top because I don't know how real that is. I actually don't know people like that. Like, I've never met anyone like that. I've met really sweet people before and girls that I thought were like, you know, like really sweet and really nice, but they always had... They just had like a little something. There was like a little dark side to them. Not that they needed it, but you know what I mean? Like they weren't, they weren't gumdrops all day long. There was a real person under there. Sometimes uh, I, I actually really can't stand that. So I don't, I hope I don't tend to sway too much towards one direction. Even in my lightness, hopefully there's a bit of a, um, a bit of a nice balance for you. But yeah, I do like to keep things pretty light. Honestly, because like it's really hard sometimes to draw a fairy and talk about something really difficult. <laughs> I feel like the art has to match um, the art, the highbrow art that I'm doing right now. I feel like it has to match the tone of my voiceover. So I guess it kind of works for this one because we made her like a little sad looking. Even though I don't feel sad, I actually feel very happy. Very, I feel very, um, I don't want to say accomplished, but very proud of myself. Oh, what have I done? I'm going to try and blot that up. <laughs> I just wanted a really light shadow. That was way too much. How do I just get a light shadow? I'm going to put that there and try and feather it out with some water. I think I'll just go back in with the pencil, to be honest. To be honest, I say that a lot. I don't like that I say that a lot. My mom's so funny. I, I was saying that a lot at home one year. Like that's, that's been a saying that stuck around for a while. Um, I was saying it at home and she goes, to be honest, why were you lying? Were you lying before? And now every time I say it, I think of that. 
So maybe that's why I don't like it. Because <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't lying before. It's just a saying. I just love how mothers get in your head like that. No, my mum's really good value. I was actually talking to her today on her way to work. It's so funny, in all the years that I'd been away as a dancer, um, I never really stayed in contact with a lot of people like outside of the contract. Because if I'm on a, in the middle of the ocean, like on a ship, I'm not really going to, you know, call home. Because it's, you know, near impossible to do that. It wasn't, it just cost a lot of money. And I was saving. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, we just didn't really stay in touch that much, which to be honest, I thought worked well for everybody because there was no pressure there. We caught up when we did and we didn't when we didn't. But ever since I moved to the States, it's, maybe it's the fact that I'm not unreachable now. Um, I actually catch up with my home a lot more often, which is nice, but it does make me a lot more homesick. So I don't know if it's really working for me or against me right now. <laughs> just put a ban on calling home. You know what else doesn't help? Kath and Kim. And I've been watching so much Kath and Kim lately. A problematic amount of Kath and Kim, I would say. It's because I was watching too much Shit's Creek. And so I was like, well, I, I can't be watching too much of one. I'll take it in turns. I can watch the same thing over and over again, the same comedies, laugh in exactly the same places as if I've never laughed at it before. There's something wrong with me. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Because I'm going to have to go back in with some finishing pencil work, or maybe not. Who knows? It's still a bit wet, so I'm probably not going to do that. I think I'll just leave it at this. Maybe I'll finish it another time. Maybe I'll do this part two one day when I've got some more stuff to say. <laughs> maybe this will just be, like, my very heavy conversation page. Um, so hopefully we never finish it. But I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for being here and uh, watching this video. Thank you for... Um, Again, understanding this past week and my kind of radio silence on social media. Having said that, I was around. Like, I was watching YouTube videos. I was watching a ton of One Book July videos. Um, don't even get me started on how confused I am about One Book July. <laughs> I need a lot of explaining going on because I've got very mixed messages about what it is. Um, so if you're doing it, please let me know how it's going. I Specifically, I'm very curious to know um, why people do it and what it is specifically. I'm a very logical person. I work with like semantics. It doesn't make sense to me that one book becomes six books. So I just need to know. <laughs> I think it has something to do with there not being rules, but I did go back and watch like a, a video from years ago, like I think around like the year after it started. And someone said that it's relative to what you're, to what you're currently using. So if I'm using seven books, maybe I downsize to like three. I don't know. I didn't watch the whole video. That's my problem. I was hoping I could get an easier explanation somewhere else. Um, but if you are doing it, I'd love to know how it's going for you and uh, specifically the reason why you do it. Like, what does it help with? What, what the challenge helps with this? Or after the challenge, I realized this and now I do this. Like, that's what I'm looking for. Um, alternatively, you don't have to say anything. Uh, but I've been, I've been around. I've been watching YouTube very much. One Book July. Lots of nail videos. I've been really into nail videos lately. I think I can do a full set of acrylics on anyone who wants one. <laughs> I really want to get Stella to let me have a go, but also it's very expensive to buy the set. I watch Nao Nails and Nail Career Education, if you're curious. Uh, Kath and Kim, Shits Creek. That's all my viewing. I've been on Instagram just watching some people's stories, but I've actually tried to stay away from Instagram a lot. Um, just because I feel that's that's where I get the most pressure to have to be engaged. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for um, for for just being there and, and for hanging in there uh, for the past week. I, I was working a lot too. I was doing a lot of uh, my travel journaling course. Why am I justifying this? I'm fine. <laughs> uh, we'll deal with that part of myself another time. Thank you so much. I'll be around next week. Uh, probably not another long chatty one like this. Maybe something else, but... Um, yeah, we'll see you then. Until then, bye.